Hey everybody, welcome back. It's good to see you. I hope you're all having a wonderful start to the new year. For those of you who are new here, my name is Quick, and I've started this whole Quick Steps thing as a way to provide free, high-quality USMLE Step 1 questions for all medical students. We have since expanded to offer USMLE Step 2 questions, a full-length USMLE Step 1 exam, clinical skills demonstrations, and even my own downloadable in-depth study guides for USMLE Step 1 in a module format. One of my New Year's resolutions is to keep expanding the platform and increasing its usefulness for all of you out there. If you want to explore what our resource has to offer in full, you can always check out our website at www.quickstepsmed.com or just click the link in the description. With that being said, I also wanted to thank all of you for your ongoing support and your wonderful feedback. Now, today we have something very special for you. One of my very close friends and colleagues has generously offered to present some orthopedics content for us. Now, this content is specifically targeted for medical students who are interested in orthopedics or orthopedic surgery and will hopefully be of use to you on your rotations. When reviewing the step two and shelf content, especially for orthopedics, it seems to be lacking. So hopefully this is our way of trying to fill in that gap for you. I would like to thank the presenter in advance for sharing his knowledge with us, and I will turn it over to him now. Enjoy. Hi, welcome to Quick Steps. Today we'll be beginning a new series on orthopedic surgery. This is for third year and fourth year medical students on their away rotations. You need to get a quick and dirty on all the various cla uh, fracture classifications. In this video, we'll be going over those fracture classifications, and this is mainly for a mnemonics to help you remember when you're in the heat of uh, getting uh, pimped by your attendings. So we'll begin with the relevant upper extremity and work our way down. So first is the distal clavicle. Um, so this is the almond slash near classification. When I think of the almond classification, I think of the almond brothers, and they're an old country band. I think of the clavicle as a sage, and so almond classification is the almond brothers playing on the clavicle. Knowing what it is is not particularly high yield, but we'll go over it here. Type one is lateral to the coracoclavicular ligaments. Type two A will be medial to the CC ligaments. Type two B1 will be between the coracoclavicular ligaments with the conoid ligament torn. That's the medial of the two. Type 2, B2 will be lateral to the coracoclavicular ligaments with the conoid and trapezoidal ligaments torn. Type 3 will be a fracture that extends into the AC joint. Type 4 is physeal, seen in pediatric patients. Type 5 is a comminuted fracture. AC joint separation is the Rockwood classification. Rockwood sounds like a redwood, and I think of the California redwood tree. I think of it falling on somebody and dislocating their shoulder. So that's my mnemonic. Again, not particularly high yield to know. Type one is a partial AC ligament tear. Type two will be complete. Type three is AC plus the CC ligaments we had spoken about prior being torn. And type four is a clavicle dislocation, being dislocated either back, up, or down. I think give it like a video game, back, up, down, back, up, down. So those are types four through six. Next up is the scapula. You will never be asked this, but I threw it in here because maybe the name may pop up, Eidberg classification. And so the scapula is shaped like an iceberg. So when I see iceberg, I think Eidberg classification. Moving on to the proximal humerus, this is very high yield. So this is the near classification. I don't have a mnemonic, but I have a concept for you here. Um, and that's in understanding tolerances of the fracture you can allow before you begin surgery. And what those tolerances are based on are the joint proximal to the fracture. So we see here that the proximal humerus has the glenohumeral joint or the shoulder joint proximal to it. And so we know that the shoulder is hypermobile, that's its definition, and therefore you would expect higher tolerances to be allowed. And we see here that for each fracture frag fragment, we can allow up to one centimeter of displacement in 45 degrees of angulation with one exception being the greater tuberosity, which is only five millimeters. Um, another common question you might get asked is, um, what, on x-ray, what view would you wanna see if an axillary is not 
possible. And that can be because the patient is in pain, and so you can get a Velpo view. I think of it as Velpo for whelps or Velps. Next up is humeral shaft. So same idea. The proximal joint here is the shoulder joint, the glenohumeral joint. So again, high tolerances will be allowed in the humeral shaft. Uh, coronally, it's less than 30 degrees of displacement. Sagittal is less than 20 degrees. And shortening is less than 3 centimeters. Common eponym to know, you get a spiral distal third fracture uh, with extension of the wrist palsy, so radial nerve palsy. You ask the patient, can you extend your wrist? They'll do so. Maybe they'll have some weakness. You'll notice some sort of extension deficit in the wrist. You're going to call that a Holstein-Lewis fracture because it's got a radial nerve palsy, and that palsy is reversible. We'll go over more of a high high yield questions you might get asked in a future videos. Next up, coronoid process. Coronoid means hook, and so when you look at it, it looks like a hook, and that's how I remember what the coronoid process is. And now that you know what it is, the way you're going to classify fractures are based off of the amount of fracture that's involved in the hook. So type 1 would be a tip fracture of the coronoid process. Type 2 is less than 50% involvement of the entire coronary process, and type 3 is greater than 50%, and that's Reagan mori Okay, following that, we got the radial head. So this is the Mason classification. I always hear people say, oh, Freemasons rule everything. So I think of the phrase Masons at the head. That helps you remember this one. Type 1 will be non-displaced, less than 2 millimeters. Type 2 is displaced. Type 3 is comminuted, and type 4 uh, is a fracture with an elbow dislocation. Next up, Montagia fracture. Montagia fracture is a proximal ulnar fracture with a radial head dislocation. And so the classification here is the Bado classification. The phrase I came up with is bad apple, A-P-L-E specifically. So the A stands for, in type 1, the proximal ulnar fracture with the anterior radial head dislocation. That's the A. Type 2 is the P, so proximal ulnar fracture with posterior radial head dislocation. Type 3, lateral head dislocation with the ulnar fracture. That's the L. And type 4, you're going to have an ulnar fracture, a radius fracture, and a dislocation of the radial head. So that's E or everything. So bad apple, A-P-L-E. All right, moving along. Next up, we have distal radius fractures. Now, you won't be getting pimped on any fracture classifications per se. However, what you will be asked on are what the native measurements are of the distal radius and whether or not you're varying based on the fracture pattern that you will be shown. So what I have here for native measurements is a calculation on screen, 11 plus 11 equals 22. 11 degrees represents volar tilt, which is the image on the right with the red lines. 11 millimeters represents radial height, 22 degrees represents radial inclination, which is the image on the top left with the black lines. And you will find that there's many different reasons why you should and why you should not operate on a distal radius fracture. However, if you're looking for the quick and dirty, which is the purpose of this video, you will see that if there's any change greater than five, whether it be five degrees or five millimeters, you should operate. After that, you got Galeazzi. That's a radius fracture with an ulna dislocation. The dislocation specifically at the distal radial ulnar joint. All right, and a common phrase is bad mugger. MU is Montegia for ulnar fracture, and GR here, which is Galeazzi for the radius fracture. And so that's how you can remember Montegia versus Galeazzi. Bad mugger. All right, that's upper extremity. Next up, lower extremity, we got the femoral neck. This is the garden classification. This is by far the highest yield out of everything you will see in this entire video. And in fact, it's so high yield that even if I didn't go over it, you would see it so many times that by your first or second week, this would be as natural as breathing. So your garden classification, type 1 is valgus impacted. Type 2 will be a complete fracture that's non-displaced. Type 3 is a complete fracture with less than 50% displacement. Type 4 is a complete fracture with greater than 50% displacement. Another classification system you may get asked is Powell's classification. I just remember POW over the hip. Next up, femoral shaft. This is the Winquist classification. And so I think of Bob Burnquist, who's a skateboarder. And so skateboarders are always falling and breaking something. So I imagine Bob Burnquist breaking his leg while he's skateboarding. And that's for femoral shaft fractures, the Winquist classification. Type 1 will be no butterfly. 
Type 2 is a butterfly, less than 25% involvement of the uh, cortex. Type 2 is a butterfly fragment with less than 50% less than 50% cortical involvement. Type 4 is a butterfly fragment with greater than 50% cortical involvement plus comminution. And type 5 is severe comminution. And there's Bob Bergquist again. Tibial plateau, very high yield. This is the Schatzker classification. So a resident explained this to me as imagining uh, a couple breaking up. So first you split. So type 1 is a lateral split of the uh, tibial plateau. And then right after you guys break up, you're going to be depressed, right? So lateral split plus a depression of the lateral tibial plateau. And then after you split, you're just depressed. So type 3 is lateral depression of the tibial plateau. And then type 4 it keeps going. Type 4 is a medial tibial plateau split. And then type 5 is bicondylar tibial plateau fracture. And then type 6 is interesting. It's a metaphyseal and diaphyseal dissociation. So you'll see this sort of fracture on x-ray. And certain types of the Schatzka classification have certain associations, whether it be meniscal tears or popliteal artery injuries. I will be going over these in a subsequent video when we go over fracture conferences for the lower extremity. Next up, tibial shaft. So I want you to compare the tibial shaft fracture now to the humeral shaft that we had discussed prior. Same idea with describing the fracture patterns, spiral, comminuted, transverse, etc. And so the tolerances for the tibial shaft are actually much more strict than what you had seen in the humeral shaft. And that's because of the concept that I had explained earlier, which is you have to see that tolerances are based off of the joint that's proximal. So in this case, the proximal joint here is the knee, which is a hinge joint. And now all of a sudden, all these numbers being so small, all these tolerances being so tight make sense. So now for AP, you have 10 degrees of uh, deformity allowed. Varus and valgus, only five degrees allowed. And so varus has five letters, so five degrees. Shortening is one centimeter and rotation is 10 degrees. Um, cortical apposition, not opposition. This is apposition with an A. It's kind of annoying, I know, but we're looking for contact here. So it's greater than 50%. If you think about that logically, we're doing tolerances, so why would you want opposition to be greater than 50? It has to be contact, which is greater than 50 degrees. All right, last but certainly not least, or second to last, is the malleolar fractures. So probably some of the most high-yield things you'll ever see. This will show up basically every rotation. It's the bane of every med student's existence, the loggy Hansen classification. It's wieldy. It's descriptive. Um... It's not very predictive either on top of all that. So it's really just pimp fodder for your rotations, but you got to know it. So here we are. So it's two things. So you have the position of the ankle when the fracture occurs and the force that's applied on the ankle. So there's two positions, supination or pronation, and you have three forces, either external rotation or abduction or a deduction. And so that creates four possibilities anatomically. So supination, external rotation, S-E-R, supination, adduction, S-A-D, pronation, external rotation, P-E-R, pronation, abduction, P-A-B. The majority of the time, it's going to be S-E-R, supination, external rotation. If you were going to only remember one of these four, you should know S-E-R. And I got a mnemonic just for you, Sir Apes, so... S-E-R-A-I-P-S. So this is something I learned on an away rotation as well. A resident pointed it out to me. So A-I-P-S means antero inferior to postero superior. This is the direction of the fibular fracture, which I pointed out here um, on this image. When you get the lateral view of the lateral mouth, you will see this fracture line, and that'll help to confirm that it is, in fact, S-E-R. This is the quick and dirty. You may, be, you may get asked the other ones, that's unfortunate, but in general, you're going to always see the S-E-R fracture. Okay, last but certainly not least, we got the Weber classification. This one's pretty straightforward. The only thing that you may get tripped up on is the fact that ABC is actually the opposite. So what do I mean by that? In general, you have a fracture and it's either below the syndesmosis, at the level of the syndesmosis, or above the syndesmosis. You would think it's descending order, so ABC from the top but it's actually ABC from the bottom up. So A is infrasyndesmotic, which is distal. 
B is at the level of the syndesmosis, which is transsyndesmotic, and C is above the level of the syndesmosis, so that's suprasyndesmotic. All right, that's all I got for this video. These are just mnemonics to help you remember. This is the quick and dirty, the intro. Um, subsequent videos, we will be having fracture conferences. I will be going over an actual fracture conference, things I have seen and things I have been asked. And so I think that'll be very, very useful for you. It should be quite exhaustive and quite, quite conclusive. So I think with all that done, you should be ready for your away rotations. So wish me the best of luck and stay tuned.